Hi, I'm Tony Oliver, and you are at Comics Online. After all these years, I found a new body. Matt, Rita has returned. Recruit a team of former teenagers for interviews. What time is it? I believe it's Morphin Time. Oh, you know what? It's Morphin Time. It's Morphin Time. It's Morphin Time. It's Morphin Time. Tony, thank you so much for joining us for our 30th anniversary uh, Power Rangers interview mm-hmm. series. Uh, you know, our interviews go back to t- year 2007 for the first Power Morphicon. Yeah. You know, we've, we've known each other through a couple conventions, but excited to include you in this special series. Well, thanks. It's nice to be here. So since our original 2007 Morphicon interview got lost, I'd love to just start off with your memories of the series and going back to the beginning of you know, just where you thought the show was going to go or what your first experiences were kicking this whole thing off. All right. Well, um, yeah. When we first, when I first started, I, I was introduced to it when Hayam called me. Hayam Saban, who owns Saban Entertainment, called me up uh, to be part of. Uh, uh, he had weekly development teams that would meet when they were, were trying to develop stuff, and they'd bring some of the creatives in. And so I was brought in for that. And he showed us this picture, this this show, Zhu Rangers, actually, of you know spandex guys and latex monsters and destroying Tokyo, and said basically he wants us to remove the um, uh, the Asian stuff. Uh, and uh, which left just the spandex, uh, you know, Power Rangers and the latex monsters, uh, and then craft a show around it, uh, an American show, original, to forget what the Japanese are doing. Um, I, I thought he was crazy. I thought he was nuts. Um, I think I may have told him that. Um, uh, but, uh, but we did it. I started working on it, and it took about six months of development on it before we started realizing we had something. And then, um, then we, fo- we, we did an episode or two, and we focus grouped it. We took it to a focus group with kids, and they went crazy. So we thought when we premiered, we were going to, we'll do okay. You know, we knew kids were going to like it, you know, because we'd shown it to kids. <laughs> you know, if we're not dumb enough to put it on the air without at least showing it to someone first. And, um, and, uh, but the, the, the speed at which it took off and the fact that within a month we went from the, the early morning Saturday morning show they were trying to bury because they were afraid of it, to the anchor show at three o'clock in the afternoon in in less than thirty days, and um, that was uh, that was remarkable, and that that just blew us away. We were totally taken aback and surprised by the whole thing. Well, we first met. You told me about the Universal Studios event mm-hmm. and how, for pretty much everyone involved with the show, that was the it moment. Yeah. Um, could could you share your experience with that and where you, well, where you were in the involvement? Yeah, we were there to, to announce that uh, that that uh, uh, the Power Rangers were going to be Dare ambassadors for Dare America. And so we arranged to do this this uh, presentation at Universal Studios uh, theme park uh, in the Fievel Theater, which doesn't exist anymore, which is this tiny little 500 seat theater. And we were going to do, uh, and it was basically introducing the Power Rangers. Uh, they were going to come in flipping and doing their stuff. I even had uh, Red Ranger uh, Austin coming in on a on a zip line over the audience, and uh, and so we did all that. And uh, the, the, we had the final rehearsal the day before, and uh, then they they called me up to the office and asked me to to to, to meet with them and. And told me that they had received like 35,000 phone calls already. And they were going to move us from the Fievel Theater to the Universal Amphitheater with 6,500 seats. <laughs> um, and I had to come back the next morning to, to, uh, to, uh, to restage the show. When I got there at about 4.35 o'clock in the morning, because you know, that's how early we had to do it, there was already about 1,000 kids waiting in line. Um, and, uh, and we completely sold out the park by 9 a.m., uh, 50,000 people showed up. They had to turn away 30,000. They closed the freeway. <laughs> they closed freeway off ramps because it caused a 10-mile backup on the freeway. Um, it was uh, and it was a Beatles moment for me because I, I was watching this this presentation, which I had written and directed. And and you know, Tommy comes on, and this girl stands up right next to me and starts yelling Tommy and crying like he was a Beatle. You know, like it was the Beatles. Um, it was pretty. Uh, it's one of the highlights of my career, actually. <laughs> when you actually get to see the impact you have on people, it's really rare when you work in television. Well, 
all the original team members and cast and crew included have all shared this story in different variations. Mm-hmm. So Ron Wasserman just shared recently about you know his where he was when this was taking place, mm-hmm. and even Richard Horvitz, you know, of him announcing the Rangers coming in in Alpha's voice mm-hmm. and, and how <laughs> crazy that was. Uh, but I, I've loved hearing the story from each of your perspectives over mm-hmm. the years. So thank you for sharing. Oh, thanks, thanks. Um, I'd love to just talk about Saba. You got to voice Saba, uh, you know, yeah. for uh, for season two when Tommy returns and, and as the White Ranger. How did that come about? Well, I, I wanted I, I was doing the casting for the ADR characters, uh, uh, and so I wanted to cast a, a gentleman named Ted Lehman, who I'd worked with on Robotech. He played Exodor on Robotech, and he had this lovely little British voice that he used for that. So I wanted that for for Saba, and uh, but I couldn't find him. He had re- turned out he retired and moved to Tennessee. He was in his seventies to take care of his mother, and so. Um, so I was describing to the producers what this character sounded like. And so, uh, and they basically said, well, well, then you do it. Just, you do it. You, you're an actor. <laughs> so, so that's how I, that's how that came about. And, uh, and so I played Saba for, you know, eight episodes or however long it lasted. What, I mean, when you think about the fact that it is 30 years and Mighty Morphin continues to be really the entry for so many people, mm-hmm. what is your takeaway from that? You know, why do you think that that iteration of Power Rangers continues to, to be the most prominent Version of well, uh, to a certain sense, because it was first, it was the first iteration of it, and nobody had ever seen anything like that on television before. So that that in and of itself makes it a kind of a special moment for a lot of kids because it was such a huge hit across all kingdom. <laughs> um, you have a huge population of adults now who have really fond memories uh, of of that as being a, an integral part of their childhood, and I think that's part of what's kind of propelled it. If you notice the 30th anniversary special that they just did. Uh, you know, they brought back, they really captured the flavor of the original, you know, and we, we, we had a, we had a style to it that, that it had to evolve eventually, but, but that little, that style I think had some charm that people find nostalgic now. Fantastic. Yeah. Tony, thank you so much for taking time and uh, pleasure to see you again, my friend. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks Stay everybody. for more Power Rangers coverage at Comics Online.